So I have the, the game server running on the left-hand pane. It's sort of just like listening for open connections coming in. Uh, so I can actually just connect to it using standard telnet uh, 7913. And then once you get dropped in, you see like logs start to like come in on the left-hand side. So we're getting client connections to the game server. So if it gives you this you know, welcome message and you can type help, um, gives you all the information that you could do within the game itself. We're sort of giving all the players these terminal prompts and then consuming all of the commands that they have, parsing them and then sending back results based on what they typed in. So you could do something like identifying yourself and this sort of saves your state in a database in the background. And then you can actually start to play an actual game. So right now you're in this sort of like open part. You're not actually playing a game yet. We okay. started with that concept. So it sort of like dumped you right into an initial game. And then you just start like playing and looking around. But we wanted to take a little bit more like abstract approach of, well, what if we could just like build an engine and then you can load in like different games at any time you want. So if you wanted to swap over and play something else. So we have these two play commands. So if you just type play, it actually tells you what scripts are loadable and what games right. are sort of playable. So then you can choose play zombie script. Let's Look spell like it right. Above where it says, welcome to, how do I pronounce that? <laughs> Avon Thierry. Avon Thierry. Where, what is yes. that from? It's the Icelandic version of Adventure. Oh, okay. I love it. When this whole class started, and sort of one of the reasons why I wanted to do this mm -hmm. type of class is because I was in Iceland for like the first two weeks of this semester with my wife on our honeymoon. Oh, uh, congratulations. <laughs> thanks. So that's why I had all these ideas floating around Iceland while I was out there. And so that's sort of where the name of the game came from. And uh, oddly enough, like the 7913, the port number that you connect to, is sort of like a uh, like a magic three numbers that have like a mythical Icelandic meaning. It's 7, 9, and 13. So if you actually Google that, like 7, 9, and 13 Icelandic, you'll like have some like lore that you can read on on why they're oh, wow. important numbers. Okay. Yeah, it's just, it just random stuff. <laughs> cool. So like once you hit, once you type play and you pick a script that you want to play, It'll immediately, it loads. I can show you what that file actually looks like. This is what this file actually looks like. Okay. Um, so we defined what a script file is. These keywords, this welcome keyword, this area keyword, dialogue east, all of these like repetitive like keyword identifiers are all known to the game engine. And so as long as you know what those do, you can sort of build a script based on those known keywords. And so you Excellent. can define an area with a dialogue that you're, that you're sort of presented with. So this, you find yourself alone in a wooded forest, is the first area of the game. So you notice when I go back to the connection, when I played it, that's the script. That's the dialogue that I was presented with as I'm playing. Right. But you know, from player, you can't see the entire script. And the whole idea of a text adventure mug game is you need to just explore and figure things out. So you could sort of look at the forest if you want to, and it might tell you like, oh, it's nothing interesting. And you could sort of keep poking around and exploring, which is the whole premise of a text adventure game. But obviously there is a, a little hint of, you know, something off into the east, so you can move east if you want to. And then if you type an appropriate command, it does actually move you in a direction and presents you with the next dialogue. And if we go back and look at that dialogue, we say we moved east so we sort of connected east to the street light area and so we're given a new dialogue to look at so we're in a clearing and then we can then if we want to we can move we can move north and now we're at this like shipping container and we can sort of like look uh look at the door and nothing interesting but if we look at container floor as you sort of like explore around and figure out like, what am I looking at? Like eventually you'll come across like the appropriate area to look at and it'll give you a little bit of hint. And then once you do that, you could use the pick command. You say, I want to pick up the, the key, no item there. 
so you do have to be a little bit, you do have to be very explicit about what to pick up. So it's old iron key. Oh, look, it's script. I think it's swapped out. It should eventually print. Oh, I know what that did. It printed this. It should have said you pick up the bloody key and place it in the pocket. So okay. that's a parsing bug. But now that like that iron key is like in your in your inventory, so then you could start moving around, move um, south again, and sort of move your way move your way through it. Well, which like all and all these commands are are still available to you. Not part of like the multiplayer section here is if say somebody I want to uh, connect again as another player. And then I'm going to I'm going to move into the same game. So I'm going to play zombie <clears throat> script over here too. So now we have two players connected playing the same script. So at this point, I can actually do like say anyone, uh, yeah, anyone else playing. And so that's so what what that does, and I think this is what like Avery was was working on, is once that happens, we take that we take that message and we sort of store it on the server for all the other connected players. So then the next time something happens here, I think if we move move north, what's what's the command that'll kick it off? I will like to actually say something over here. Say, and I'm not move. sure if it's been changed after merging, but I think it is area locked. So they would need to be in the same area to hear their messages. Oh, okay. And that might be why it didn't show up. That's possible. Area lock. So I need to be. Where am I? <laughs> I'm at the streetlight. Move east. Move north. All right, now we're in the same area. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so I was now that we're in the same area, and I said on the left, hello, when the player on the right starts to interact. It's so and now before it actually does anything, it like looks at the broadcast queue. Okay. From people in the same area, and it'll tell you like somebody said something. <laughs> okay, got it. Are the various objects persistent in that? If you got the key, if the first player got the key, will the second player not be able to get the key, or does everybody have their own copy of the key? Everybody's got their own copy. So, sort of like the idea of like you're, we're sort of breaking the rules of reality at that point. Right, but it makes the game playable. It makes it playable. So the reason why we wanted to like have these like rough communications here is like because I mean you saw me sort of stumbling my way through my own script that I wrote and I still couldn't remember where I was like what to look for mm -hmm. uh, and that's as typically as you play these text adventure games you have like a physical notebook that you're like drawing out like the right. diagrams and that's part of the fun like what the world looks like and making notes that like this is a container I picked up the key in this room and I sort of move around but in any cases where you're like, if you're really just like stuck, like perhaps there's like a player that already got there and is moving through it, that maybe you can just ask for a question or post a message on right. that wall. And then once they're in there and they see that message and say, oh, what if you looked at the container floor? And then when you come back, like that message is going to be there for you to get that little extra hint to move your own game along. Yeah, I mean that's this basically the gist and like the powers like being able to do all of this all of this stuff and we had to, we had Tell to me, build. what was what was the other game? Uh that was this adventure. I think it was just called adventure. Oh, there's the other person responding back. There it is. <laughs> oh, okay. Play. Adventure. Uh, so now we're in a brand new game, um, and that one is this one. This is the one that Jack okay. wrote up. There's a lot more stuff going play. on. There's a lot oh, more okay. stuff to just like work yourself through. So he was able to like, he didn't really, that the point was like, you don't have to know hair to write a game 
to the engine. Right. Like as long as you understand the basic building blocks, you could sort of stitch them and put them together. So currently, is there a way if somebody is playing your game that they can save their progress? It already does. So as you as you issue commands, it always saves the current the game in the current area of where you're at. So you could quit and return. That's sort of the that's the point of the the nickname. Like oh, so it's not a nickname. nickname. Yeah. So it knows that there's no like security around it. So technically, like somebody else could identify themselves as Blaine, but like the internet was the wild west back then. Right. <laughs> you don't have much security in the first place. Um, no, it is, just there, does... is there a separate command then to reset everything? Not yet. You can, as long as you, it, it's the last game and the last command that you played. So right now, because I switched to, to adventure script, like it's so it's saved that state. Oh, okay. oh no, it, it's it actually saves zombie script too. So you, if you switch back, it should keep track of like the script that you were playing or the game that you're playing and what area you left off at. Okay. And I, I don't know if we persisted the items yet, so that that's just an addition. Okay, maybe step that's there. something for future work. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So talk about hair and why you what hair is. When I mention it to people, they haven't heard of it, and I hadn't heard of it. Yeah. What is hair, and what made you want to choose hair for this project? I wanted to try this. I've been using hair in the past just because I've had a lot of exposure to a lot of programming languages in my career. The most recent ones that I've personally been working on are the very, very popular ones in gaming and sort of distributed systems. So that's Go. I've taken a lot of C++ classes already in this master's program. I've done some C in the past. Python's extremely popular for like doing stuff like this and Rust recently as well. They're all very popular. There's a lot of documentation. There's a lot of people building game engines. There's just a lot of stuff out there. And I sort of stumbled across hair from a group of folks that were building it because they wanted to build a systems programming language that was better, has better tooling and better ergonomics than C does, but didn't have like the direction from a very large corporation like Google does for Go and Mozilla does for Rust. This group of folks is like very old school, like everything should be open source, like nothing is hidden, everything is free, like it's literally free and open source. And so that's the sort of like background to creating this systems language that's not C. And so I started using it. And so I, I got the sense that it does have a lot of crossover with Go because some of it was inspired by it. And so it sort of like felt fairly familiar to me. But one of the major differences of Hair itself is because it's geared towards more systems programming, you do have to do manual memory management like you do in C. It's a little nicer than C, whereas a language like Go has a garbage collector, it has a runtime, it has a lot of nice things that you don't have to worry about that stuff. So I would put hair in the class of it's C-based, it's C++-like, you know, Rust is also falling in there. You can do some systems programming and by what I mean by that is like you, the author of hair itself is actually writing an operating system from scratch with the wow. programming language he's writing <laughs> sort of at the same time. So it's interesting to see the progress. That's not there. normally something you would use for a project like this. Did you just want to have a reason to use hair because hair looked cool? I also wanted to like stretch all of the skills that you need to like do systems programming, like dealing with the memory stuff, dealing with doing structure-based uh, or data structure-based work. It's a good programming work. exercise. Yeah, yeah. And it's it sort of like it, it gives you the mental model to like focus on the data instead of these, instead of an object-oriented language, like with classes and methods and things like that. Right. That's way more focused on the data itself instead of like these arbitrary objects that should be representing the real world. And so that's where it sort of sits in like that systems programming space a bit more. It, the, the, cha the challenges with this itself is because it's such a young language, like we had to pull in a lot of stuff to like get things to work because 
it didn't have a database for us to persist stuff to a database system. Like you can't just pull in MySQL and start to save things to MySQL or SQL Server or Postgres. Like there's nothing. There's nothing out there. There's no drivers for it yet. The, the game itself is sort of like a means to an end. Like my ultimate goal is to sort of expose myself and more people to like systems programming languages outside of just like, well, C is the only way to do it or right. C is the only way to do like embedded stuff. It's like, well, there's more out there. And rather than trying to do projects that are just like, you know, just to br brute force and grunt your way through like an embedded systems project, which isn't all that exciting sometimes, like, well, you get to make a game and you sort of like pick up the systems programming along the way. Like you got to deal with memory. You got to deal with data structures. You got to do all that stuff. So you sort of... Have the hair folks made any graphics libraries for it? Like they have, they have wrappers around SDLC two or S SDL two, which okay. is I think the one of the popular yeah uh, C ones. Yep. So that's out there. Okay. So yeah. So this is this hair is really in its infancy. It's definitely passionate people working on it. 